So welcome everybody. Um, uh, so my name is David Gronewigan. Um, I'm the uh, University Librarian at La Trobe University and a member of the Open Access Australasia Executive Group. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's events. Uh, like an open book, can academic communities ensure our voices are heard by all? Um, uh, probably need to go to the next slide if we could, Richard. So um, like to start by um, having uh, reckon, having uh, just noting that Open Access Australasia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Uh, Open Access Australasia recognises the Turbal and Yungara, Bedegal, Irangaji, Jubadai and Gumui Wawabara Yindinji as the First Nations owners of the lands where they work. And I apologise for my pronunciation of those. Uh, we also pay our respects to all Indigenous peoples wherever they are in the world, including the Ngāi Iwi Māori, the Kandata Wenehu of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you. So just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we know you will have seen that we are recording this session and it will be shared and made publicly available. Um, we will also ask if you could just mute your microphone and turn off your camera just to make sure that everybody's bandwidth can cope with uh, all of this. Uh, if you do have any questions, um, we'll be taking those via Slido. Uh, we'll be putting the link in the chat. There it is. Um, uh, and so please uh, feel free to add any questions or to upvote any questions that you are interested in uh, in there. And we'll try and uh, take those as we go or uh, we'll have an opportunity to look at them at the end. Um, and there it is again. There's the code in case you've already gone to Slido. Um, so uh, just what we're going to do today is uh, we will be um, starting off with uh, a discussion from a group of panellists uh, who have got uh, a, a number of different takes uh, on uh, open access, particularly as it relates to book publishing. Um, and then uh, we will have in the second hour a um, an opportunity for all of you to discuss uh, some of the issues that have come up in breakout rooms uh, to contribute your thoughts. Uh, and these will be brought together um, uh, later on uh, as a blog post to summarise the sort of uh, uh, discussions that we've had. Um, there will be a, a link to a Google Doc. You'll be able to um, add your comments and thoughts to that. So um, at this point, then, I might uh, introduce our panellists. Um, wait till we can see them. I'll start introducing, oh, there we go. Um, so uh, going through my list is the, in the order that I have them here, I'll start by introducing Dr. Michael Kopp. Uh, Michael is a senior lecturer in English at the University of Otago. His teaching and research focuses on Shakespeare, Milton, Renaissance biblical literature and effective writing and communication. The latter is, re latter is the reason he's joining us today as a creator of one of the open educational resources publishes part of the core OER collective. Um, our second speaker uh, is Associate Professor Sigi Jotkant, uh, who is a senior lecturer in the School of Arts and Media in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at UNSW. Uh, her research interests are 19th and 20th century British and American literature, especially Henry James and Vladimir Nabokov, Lacanian psychoanalysis and contemporary French philosophy. She's a co-founding director and editorial board member of the Open Humanities Press, a scholar-led press founded on principles of access, scholarship, diversity, and transparency. Uh, Dr. Nathan Hollier is the manager of ANU Press. Nathan has been in this role for just a couple of months, but ANU, as many of you will know, has been an innovator in the open access space for many years. Uh, Nathan comes to ANU having previously been at Melbourne and Monash University Presses. Uh, and Tom Rennie is the publisher at Bridget Williams Books. Uh, or BWB. Over the last three decades, BWB has contributed to critical scholarship in New Zealand with a focus on our stories, seeking to deepen understanding what it is to inhabit these islands. Tom's work has been included, has included leading BDWB's development in the digital space through the last decade. So welcome everybody uh, today and thanks so much for your time. Um, 
So what we're going to talk about today uh, is really about books, which are in many ways the neglected little sibling uh, when we talk about conversations around open access. Um, but they continue to play a really critical role in academic discourse and career progression. Access to books has not increased in the same way that we've seen with journal articles, although increasingly we see books uh, subject to the same kind of open access mandates that have been uh, in the journal space for a number of years. Um, and as a result, a sustainable way forward in this space is still being mapped out, although we do have some notable successes already, and we'll be talking about some of those today. Um, importantly, though, in an increasingly globalised publishing ecosystem, what might be seen as a niche subject elsewhere is often vital local or Indigenous history knowledge or understanding. These local voices can be hard to find and hear in a crowded information landscape, and we need to think about how we can improve that. So today we'll be looking at some of the challenges and opportunities in this space, particularly, obviously, from an Australasian viewpoint. Um, and as we do so, we'll touch on other questions, which we'll invite you to discuss further in your groups. Uh, what is an academic book in this age of increased access? They can be multimedia. Uh, they can be print on demand. Do they have to be electronic to really exist? And if they are only electronic, how do we uh, operate the trust systems that we've used in the past? Who are we targeting now with our work? Is it the academy or is it the public or both? Um, what is the role of the academic library? Should they be a, a publisher? Do they be a supporter of, of, of other presses? Again, or is that, the, is that part of both their roles? So today we'll be looking at a number of different perspectives from people who produce academic books in all their many shapes and forms. So what I might do now is invite each of these speakers uh, to just give a quick summary of their model and how they work in this space. Um, uh, and then we'll proceed to the questions. So I'll go back to my list that I already have and start with uh, Michael, if that's all right. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Michael Cobb from the University of Otago. Uh, just a quick background of where this book came from. Aside from teaching a lot of writing papers, I test the language skills of incoming health sciences first year students. So those who are wanting to become health professionals. And for 10 years, I've used the data from that testing to see how students succeed based on li uh, linguistic capabilities. So what we did a few years ago is we cross-referenced the linguistic data with socioeconomic markers like school decile or the New Zealand deprivation index. And what we found was that there were some pretty noticeable socioeconomic disparities among our students. And so my goal was to help level the playing field. So I started making electronic digital resources to help our students, such as free uh, video tutorials. But the next step was try to mitigate financial shortfalls where I could. Um, and the only other place that I could really see making, uh, making a difference was a free textbook for our students. As we all know, textbooks are quite expensive, which is why I'm on the panel today. I've uh, edited an open access textbook for our students who fail the English diagnostic and uh, to try and make that information more accessible to all of our students. Lovely. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Siggy. Thank you so much. Yes, so I'm the co-founding director of Open Humanities Press, which is a scholar-led um, publisher that publishes journals and uh, monographs, academic books, as well as we have a, a lab series which does more experimental work um, using the, well, we haven't yet published anything using the Scalar platform, but that's our goal to have more multimedia offerings as well. Um, we founded in 2006, we launched in 2008, um, began with just a, a small stable of open access journals. But uh, very shortly after we launched, we there was a lot of um, interest in what we were doing. And the immediate question was, this is all very well for um, to be working in journals, but what about books? Because we are a, a humanities disciplinary um, press. And so we joined up with a library, the University of Michigan Library. Um, we're based in the UK, even though I'm here in Australia, it's an international project. We joined up with the scholarly publishing office with the University of Michigan Library and started publishing our first books. And after a few years, we parted ways and, um, and we have just continued independently to publish open access books, um, which are free to download as PDFs 
and um, and also one can buy them as uh, reasonably reasonably priced paperbacks. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nathan. Thanks, David, and hello, everybody. Yes, uh, ANU Press, as many of you will know, is a uh, major open access publisher of books and journals. We have an event uh, next week celebrating 100 million downloads of ANU Press titles and uh, the university repository um, uh, documents. Uh, so an event to celebrate that. And ANU Press has been operating for uh, about 20 years, so it's very well established. And as David has mentioned, I've been with the press just for a couple of months, but I've known it uh, and its previous managers quite well. And um, my background uh, is in academic publishing, uh, going back right to the sort of early, or well, Around 2006, I was I ran a, an imprint for Curtin University, uh, and then ten years as manager of Monash University Publishing, where I was fortunate to work under uh, to report to David, our chair today, for most of that time. And uh, Monash certainly had an interest in open access publishing. Uh, then I had four years with Melbourne University Press as CEO and publisher there. And uh, I, I have connections, I guess, into very much into the, uh, the trade side of publishing as well. So uh, it's very interesting for me and exciting for me to come to ANU Press with a brief to um, work to lift its impact and think about how we can, we can best do that. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Tom? Thank you, Tato. Um, so I'm Tom Rennie. I'm the publisher and manager of Bridget Williams Books, which is a long-standing independent publisher uh, based in Wellington. We're quite small, but we're quite ambitious with with what we do. And um, I just really want to acknowledge uh, Richard White and those responsible for this event um, for inviting me onto the panel. I think publishers are often missing in action a little bit when it comes to discussions around open access. And um, I'm just very appreciative of the opportunity to be here today. Um, I think a couple of things I want to set out around where we stand in terms of in terms of the discussion is that I'm uh, we didn't really pursue our work our digital work at BWV with an open access lens per se and so I certainly don't claim to be an an expert I guess in the same way that Nathan's and Nathan and others would be around around open access and running OA models but I think um, some of the motivations for what we have done with our digital publishing are hopefully relevant to some of the conversation today. Um, and the, the key the key thing that we've developed at BWB has been a platform called the Collections Platform, uh, which is a platform that we've developed and we launched in 2016. Um, and it's quite basic. It's basically making our, our backlist titles available in a static website environment. And we license that to libraries through Epic, which is a wonderful purchasing consortia based at the, uh, the National Library um, here in, in Wellington. And we license that domestically only at the moment. Um, and we launched that platform based on some frustrations we had around the existing ebook infrastructure that was out there for the sorts of books that we publish. Um, we publish books that are often heavily illustrated, rich, complex, long, very long books, and um, books that still today kind of break the, the Kindle system and break a lot of the established ebook formats. And so what we did there was sort of partly born out of those frustrations. It was also, we talked to libraries right back in 2011, 2012, when I first started working with BWB and we could hear frustrations from libraries at that time around the existing models too. Um, so we've taken that approach and I think where it starts to have some relationship to some of the conversations today is that we, it is a more liberal model, I guess, than, than other publishers have been using. It doesn't have things like, seat limits um it doesn't have windowing um it doesn't we aim to use as little sort of proprietary technology as possible we've tried to build it you know using standard web stack technology um and yeah the aim for it is that it's not for profit like all of our work at bwb um it's funding reliant and our long-term vision for it is to use it as a way to bring back in copyright but out of print works and make them available once more and we've started to do some of that we 
a book like Fatal Necessity by Peter Adams, which is a seminal early work on deterity. Um, Marilyn Waring's Counting for Nothing, which is an extraordinary, probably just about the most referenced New Zealand work of scholarship ever. I think it's extraordinary how 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 widely used that book is, and we brought that into the platform. Um, but it's taken, yeah. It's I'm always quite fascinated by bringing an out of print but in copyright book and making it available anew as a digital work is always more complex than one expects and always um brings in challenges you don't always expect so i'm i'm sort of interested to to hear people's thoughts and discussion a bit around that today thank you tom um so maybe we we can build on that uh what you've just said there by asking the question about you know how do you and happy for anyone to answer this how do you um how do you try and promote the visibility of of the work that you're putting out there? So there's there's putting things out on the internet, that sort of work. But what 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 are the sort of strategies you're trying to take to make that visible, to make that um, uh, available to people um, beyond uh, the well, it's here and now. Hopefully, someone will find it because uh, you know there's a lot of books out there. Um, and you know, most people start with Amazon, which may not be where any of you want to just want to want people to start. So, does anyone want to have a go at that one, or shall I pick someone lucky person at random? Well, David, I think it's an absolutely crucial question, absolutely crucial. And um, I think that uh, the open access uh, book, book publishers have at times been a bit guilty of what you could call uh, supply side fetishism, where we've just sort of thought, well, if we put it out there, um, you know, our job is done. And uh, as you rightly point out, there is a lot of stuff on the web. And our job is not to put it, put more stuff on there because we can get a license for it. Our job is to compete and convey the message that our material is, you know, high quality material and in fact, essential uh, reading. And so, yes, how to how to do it is is uh, really um, a crucial question, and it goes back even f you know, further from or well, how do we promote it once we've got it? We also it, it's 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 a sort of a cycle which ties in with the question of well, how do you get that high quality content? And you get it by uh, conveying to uh, the authors, the best authors with that you are going to add value to their work such that makes the, the value that you're adding is makes it competitive with other publishers because a good publisher, you know, adds value at each step of the workflow from commissioning and helping the author conceptualise the project right through to, you know, managing uh, rights and... Um, language, territorial uh, media rights. And we, we can be at something of a disadvantage, of course, because the fact that we're open access limits our capacity to partner, especially with retailers, uh, and does limit our capacity somewhat to partner with, with other media. However, open access publishing is, of course, also very valuable and very valued, particularly by scholars, I think, who are wanting to write from or for um, those parts of the world where conventional book selling and distribution breaks down uh, or, or is harder for various reasons. And so I'm particularly interested in ANU Press has a real strength in Asia Pacific publishing and publishing in Southeast Asia and on, on those parts of the world and the global South more generally. Um, but I do think that we need to partner more effectively with with libraries and with uh, with retailers where the, where the title is appropriate, um, and with media. So um, you know you can still get uh, excerpts out there and so on, and really and, and promote and so conventional media. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Siggy, I'm curious, as you, you're probably in a similar boat to Nathan in some ways, or you, what your thoughts might be on that one. Thank you so much. And um, that was really helpful to hear your perspective, Nathan. 
Um, we are kind of a, a bit of an unusual beast, if you like, because as a scholar-led project, we don't have um, any particular, and, and it's all volunteer, um, we don't have any particular need to be selling our books or having them um, participate in that kind of economy of scholarship that uh, a press that is associated, you know, with a university, you know, will have. So what we have is a model where it's based around the individual communities that have uh, either already existed or are building themselves around the scholars who are the heart of the Open Humanities Press project. So we've got this editorial board, and maybe if I can just share my screen and um, and just show here. Um, what we have is a series of book series that are edited, let me just see if this is uh, good to click through, edited by different senior scholars in these areas of critical theory and cultural studies. And these are the people who both um, attract the authors and also attract the readers. So there is the sense of a uh, an organic readership that is built out of the people who are already sort of publishing with us. Uh, we do have a, um, uh, a number of partners. So we're connected with the OAPEN um, Libraries Project in, um, in the Netherlands, and they host our, um, our books as part of their um, open access monographs um, libraries. So I'm sure that a number of our readers come to us through that um, through that wing. Um, and we also put our books up on the Internet Archive um, for permanent archiving, although this has actually started to cause some problems for us in terms of a pirating of Open Humanities Press um, content that is then repackaged and sold on Amazon without um, without permission. So that we, we've started to have to think carefully about the um, the Creative Commons licensing that we used, we we started out feeling very strongly wanting to um, to just use the CC share alike, unless our authors chose something different. But we're we're starting to reflect on whether that's actually the the best because our, our authors are also complaining about the fact that there are these unauthorized um, versions of their books um, that are are appearing. So. There are a lot of a lot of complexities really um, that that are emerging in this field. Um, so there, I can just uh, you're yeah. almost a, you're almost a victim of your own success there. Um, look, I don't know that. Yeah, I mean, you could you could have, could put it like that, but I think it's a problem uh, just more generally with open access materials. You know, it's it's not just us. I think other other projects are also having that problem. It's just you know with. Uh, the, the, you know, it's so easy to scrape materials and to repackage, it costs almost nothing. And then, you know, just upload them to Amazon. And um, I don't know if any of them actually sell these pirated copies, <laughs> um, but they're there. And, you know, we are in the process of asking them to be taken down when we um, when we encounter this. Yeah. I don't know if that. that yeah, no, no, my, my, my own university has seen some of this recently with theses being that, that we have open that are being advertised for sale on places like Amazon. Again, we have no idea whether anyone buys them, but yeah. we know our authors are not happy to see that someone could be making money out of something that they've offered up for free. <laughs> it's quite an interesting challenge. So, uh, Michael, perhaps, you know, as someone who has put a lot of work into making something freely available, have you, you know, have you thought about the, the that area of, of what you've done? Well, it's interesting for me just hearing uh, what Siggy has said. Essentially, in terms of editing and creating, that's what we do. We scrape the material, you know, uh, in order to create an open access textbook, which is what I did at uh, in a short time frame. Uh, the turnaround for a variety of reasons, and we might talk about that later. Uh, the turnaround was really short from when I had to start creating it and when it had to be implemented for my students to use. We ended up scraping material. So I guess this is more of a conceptual problem for me. I'm wondering, is there a difference between someone like me who's making a textbook and scraping material? And, you know, we're not selling it, but in the greater sense, I guess we are. That's part of the package that we offer to students. 
we're repurposing it. Is is there a is it just an ideological problem for us to on who's sharing the material or who's using it or who's capitalizing on it? And that's uh, that just picking up on what Siggy said. I don't, I don't know if you wanted to respond to that. Uh, Siggy. Um, we we have a number of projects actually that are um, edited by uh, one of the other co-founders. This is Gary Hall who has projects on what he's calling liquid and living books, which are precisely designed for this kind of recombination, you know, the scraping, the putting together in new, new forms, existing materials. And we very much support that um, as, as a project. What, what I was talking about is where you've got commercial players who are taking, you know, material that they don't actually have permission to do. Uh, and then trying to make a profit off it uh, and not not adding any kind of value or, you know, conceptual sort of, um, yeah, any anything that that is more than just the simple typeset volume that they have slapped a new cover onto and then tried to try to sell. So the problem is the, the problem for you is the monetization. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So. Michael, perhaps just following on for that, then when you, I mean, you've you've written this book for your own purposes, for your own students, for your your university, mm -hmm. it is you know that is the wider use of that something that you're concerned about, interested in? Is it as long as it suits your needs and it's openly available? You, you, is your main driver to, to make it freely available for your own students? Yeah, I, I don't think I'm really concerned about the monetization. I mean. Uh, there's such a barrier to entry for a university to begin with that uh, if people wanted to use the work in uh, different ways, and if it is freely available, why would someone pay for it in the first place? I mean, I'd like to see the data on if this if this work got repackaged and sold on Amazon, it would have to be someone who's relatively unsavvy, I think, who would pay for pay for it when they could probably freely access it somewhere else. Um, but in terms of um, barriers and where I'm coming from, uh, I, I was interested in the, the main barrier I don't think was for my students. It was for, for me myself to to get this out, to get it uh, to get it produced, simply because we only had two licenses at Otago. So I was actually competing with other lecturers just to get the right to make a free open access textbook that my students can use. And that, that, that in itself is a fairly big barrier. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, thankfully Richard, um, Richard White was, uh, went to bat uh, for me and I managed to get one, but even then there were other barriers that I couldn't envision as, you know, just as an academic and relatively new to the field. One, uh, for example, all the copyright difficulties and this, I guess, ties together with what we were just previously saying how much copyright work actually had to go through, we had to go through in order to get the book ready for press. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, the, there were a few surprising things for me. And I guess uh, not not being worried about the monetization in the first place, I never even thought about uh, those other aspects. Um, so, We've sort of spoken a little bit about, I mean, in, in some way, we've, we're talking about things that are successfully being discovered. Um, Tom, perhaps you could talk a little bit more about what you do to, you, you've clearly got a system that works well within your country. Do you find that's also working well at, a, at an international level? Uh, is there a demand for what you're doing outside of uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand? There, there is, there would be. We're yet to license internationally, so it's on for for our particular model. Um, we're we're planning to go international next year, starting with Australia. Um, and um, I think particularly for Indigenous content, there's there's remarkable offshore international networks for Indigenous research, and a lot of our Pacific and Maori authors. You know, the the prospect for us to be able to connect up with those networks is is a really exciting one. Um, I think the promotional side, uh, just domestically, is something you're always working at. And it's, I mean, I think it's something that generally for book publishing, just beyond the open access realm, I think has become a, a, a really big part of the last sort of 10, 15 years. I think prior to that, and I don't want to sort of paint it as a golden age, but I think it was sort of, you know, you could publish a book, release it, do good media on it, and you had a, you know, quite a well-formed um, book industry to sort of cycle it through in terms of bookshops and, and reaching readers I've found, you know, in my 10 years with, with BWB and here in New Zealand that 
with each passing year, you're having to do that much more to connect the book to readers. So for example, um, you know, we, we publish a book, we do a big media strategy around it. We have to deal with quite a um, disparate set of media outlets. We, um, we run events. We do a lot of events ourselves. Certainly pre-pandemic we were. We're now doing um, online talks um, post-pandemic or mid-pandemic maybe. Um, we have to do, we do a lot of education outreach um, to schools around the country. Um, there's all these different components and different formats. And now you have sort of audiobooks coming along. And so that's that's something that we're always having to do a lot of work on. And it's sort of the promotional side. Um, I think it's often obscured as well for people looking at particularly, I guess, traditional book publishers. They can lose sight of, I think, a lot of the work that happens upstream from a book. Um, and then I can also lose sight of a lot of the work that the publisher does downstream. So we're often working with with authors on their books in the world, two, three, four, five, sometimes even sort of 10 years down the track. Um, so it's trying to maintain that visibility is a big thing. In terms of the context of what we're doing with libraries, there's certainly more that we need to be doing with libraries. We, you know, we have to obviously be very attentive to things like metadata, getting good data out there, getting good visibility within the library systems. Um, we're, we're forever trying to connect up the events and local things that we're doing with libraries on a localized basis. Um, but there's more that we will be doing into the future around that because it's, um, yeah, it's it's vital. I think I'm also interested a little bit in this question around, you know, we, I think we, you know, we exist in this world of saturated content. I am interested in how, um, you know, the how a lot of our knowledge can stand out in a world of sort of misinformation in terms of being peer reviewed often being award-winning, um, often being material that is trusted and has also got a clear pro provenance. You know, people can see where the work has originated from, which I think is important. You know, the sort of slightly dizzying examples that Siggy and, and Michael were talking about before, when you get sort of repackaged content appearing in that way, would be quite distressing for me as a publisher to see that happening. Um, and it was quite a big reason, again, for why we went down the path of creating our own environment because I think it allowed us to communicate to librarians who already knew our work over decades in print. They could see that we were, you know, there visibly in a digital environment and that librarians and 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 users can know that when they're engaging with our works, they know that they're peer reviewed. They know that their work that's had immense, you know, quality control and care placed into them. And so I think I think there's some opportunities there for us to do more in promoting our works as being differentiated in that way from a lot of other material that you might encounter online. Um, and certainly when I was first doing our first digital collection, which was on Te Tiriti o Waitangi, um, I remember seeing some of the material that was available online before we went out with our resource. And it was concerning at times to see sort of what was being circulated um, innocently as being sort of you know good scholarship on the treaty which wasn't really and so it's been um, a rewarding thing for us to see people using books from authors that are of a high standard and are, are reliable so yeah that's something I'm quite interested in around the promotional and sort of visibility side of it. Um, thanks look I think there's uh, there's some really interesting things there and one of them sort of fits in I guess with one of the questions we've got on the Slido, which is that um, someone has asked that researchers always want to go with one of the big names, um, which are, tend to be uh, expensive or um, uh, and are often they go to the big names because of this trust thing. I think it, it's true that people say, well, you know, X publisher has been around. That brand name means something. Um, so, uh, I, you know, perhaps throw this to, to, to Siggy or to Nathan, you know, how do we how do we build that that same sort of trust in an open access publisher? You know, and Siggy, I imagine you must have been through this these sort of conversations more than once, where people have said to you, you know, my my boss says for promotion I need to be published here. Why 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 would I go to publish with you? And what what sort of strategies do you use there? Basically, we discourage them from publishing with us if they have a need to, you know. Um, to meet a promotional deadline or something like that. So um, we see ourselves as uh, a publisher for people who are in the position where they can actually choose 
um, freely choose where they want to publish. And if open access is important, more important to them at that point in their career, then of course we welcome them with open arms. But um, we tend to discourage junior scholars from coming, you know, with their their big, you know, their thesis, their dissertation, because we uh, we're acutely aware of the the continuing economy of prestige that is the institution, you know, that um, the big names are what will get you a job, and um, and our position is basically get your job first you know, find yourself in a in a stable and rewarding position, and then you can start to think about the the politics of getting your work out once you're in once you're in that position. So um OHP was really, you know, it, it's an experiment in seeing whether or not scholars can um build that level of trust and prestige that is normally associated with uh with capital. Um, and so, you know, it's it's an ongoing experiment. Um, I'm not sure that, um, yeah, it, 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 I don't think that the, um, I don't think that it's played out yet. I don't know what will have been the effect of, of what Open Humanities has done. Um, it, it, it remains to be seen, but this was very much a, initial our opening um, strategy was to try to present uh, a press that had all of the sort of the imprimatur of quality and um, uh, of prestige associating it with very, very uh, well-known names in our particular field of critical and cultural theory. You know, the, the most irreproachable names are the names of our editorial board in an effort to try to see whether or not um, you know who who actually makes prestige? Is it is it the authors and the um, and the editors, or is it the um, you know the the institutions that are the institutions of of commercial publishing? This is this is part of our ongoing experiment to see what the outcome of that um, you know of this of this is. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Nathan. Do you have any views on that one? Uh, yes, yes. Well, as Siggy has said, it's an ongoing process, this sort of contest over uh, prestige. I think one thing in uh, our favour is that many authors have uh, pretty negative experience when they do go through um, the sausage factory of some of the um, well-known um, international private scholarly publishers. Uh, I think there is continuing education work to do uh, by us and, and by like-minded and sympathetic uh, people. Um, I mean, I've had discussions with associate deans, research and so on, where, where they say, you know, we, we need to encourage our authors to be published by these big name publishers in spite of the fact that those publishers often don't add a lot of value um, and, you know, simply, um, you know, charge a lot of money to, um, to libraries to buy the content. And, you know, I remember one of the representatives from these uh, companies saying years ago that this issue about uh, the crisis of the monograph is really a, an American problem because in Europe we've solved that problem. And what he meant was they charge a lot of money for the books that they publish. So it wasn't exactly a kind of sophisticated technological or other solution. It was just that's how they work and they publish small runs uh, for, for libraries. Um, but I think that, um, you know, the, the, the open access component of what we do is actually a really big attraction for, as I said earlier, for scholars particularly who are wanting to um, write about and for parts of the world which are uh, outside of the um, first world, in inverted commas, um, uh, education systems and, and publishing systems. And if we can add sufficient value to our publishing and be supported by libraries uh, and um, where appropriate, uh, re retailers uh, and media, 
then I think that that is actually a, a pretty strong value proposition uh, for particularly for scholars writing for that scholarly uh, market as opposed to the retail market, which is a, a bit of a harder thing but can actually be pursued but is a bit harder. And although, you know, as as you've referenced, David, at the, the outset, you know, the mandates are continuing to come through about open access for, for books, um, the, the momentum in scholarly publishing with open access, for books at least, um, you know, probably isn't there. And I think that we need to, you know, continue working on adding value to what we do and improving that, that impact. Um, yep. Thanks. Yeah. David, can I jump in there uh, just sure. to pick up a, a couple of points? Uh, it was, I found it really interesting what Siggy was saying about prestige and the perception and coming from the ac the academic side, someone who's creating it, creating, say, an open access textbook, textbooks are already looked down on in terms of publication outputs. When, uh, when I also mentioned that I was doing it as an open access project, it was, colleagues didn't have a very favorable view of that. It, it seemed like this was a pet project or this was something that could easily be replaced through some of our learning platforms like Blackboard or Moodle or something like that. So there are there are significant barriers. You know, should we be publishing with OUP or CUP or something like that instead? There are there is that pressure on me personally as someone who has to publish this part of the job. So I just what what Siggy's saying is is very real for me anyway. Tom, um, I think. Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think in 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 Aotearoa, it's sort of, in some ways, perhaps a little different. Certainly, in, this, in my little neck of the woods, we, we publish largely on history and contemporary issues. Um, and I think, you know, from what I observe here, and I have the benefit of sort of the track record of Bridget Williams and what what Bridget has done with the publishing here. But um, my sense is that it's a much more relational set of of relationships than it is a sort of a transactional prestige one with with the authors that we work with um certainly you'll encounter some academics who are still interested in 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 the prestige of a of an offshore university press um, being attached to their work but generally speaking the, the authors and academics i encounter um in in those areas that i've mentioned are, are very focused on things like impact readership they want to know those simple things that people actually want to pick up or read the book on a screen you know so it's sort of um uh, i sort of feel like we're perhaps in a slightly different sphere here in in that regard and i was reading um there's a very interesting report by john shearer from the university of north carolina press around um around sort of open access with regard to history monograph publishing and i was kind of interested in that because in that report they cite one of the challenges was this reserve from some authors um, in the US regarding an open access model and I kind of I don't know I sort of think perhaps I mean open access is very diminished as a sphere in, in, in New Zealand currently but perhaps that's where an opportunity sits because I think um, I, I think there's a I don't know I risk sounding naive perhaps but I just think there's a slightly different character to, to how how academics operate here I also think to some extent the prestige question can be addressed um, by partnerships. You know, I think um, we we co-publish with, you know, Canadian um, university presses, British university presses, um, uh, and potentially, I know, it, you know, obviously it can be a bit more complex with an OA model. But I kind of, I, I my mind often when it, when you you're talking about future models for monograph publishing and book publishing, I'm I'm always interested in collaborative approaches, and I think collaborative approaches potentially is one of the ways. Um, around that sort of prestige question, if 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 that emerges, but um, yeah, I just I just think ultimately you want your book to be read, you know, you want your book to be, <laughs> um, you know, in some instances absolutely sold and 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 purchased and exchanged and shared and all those kinds of things. So I think that ultimately has to be the end goal, and I think is one that people certainly here in New Zealand are often most interested in, really. Um. So um, thanks, Tom. Can I uh, just perhaps go back to a comment you made earlier about um, Indigenous 
knowledges and indigenous publications and um uh and you know where do you think the opportunities and the challenges are going to come in that space because i again i think it's a an area i think we'd all like to see better represented sure i'm fortunate i mean my work at bwb um we have relationships with with hapu and iwi um across across the country we co-publish with naitahu um a big iwi um for te waipanamu in the south island and um so as a Pakeha publisher, I've been very fortunate to, to have these sorts of publishing relationships, which um, has allowed me to sort of observe, you know, working with Indigenous knowledge and and, and working with Indigenous authors and, and putting that through um, our publishing system and our digital publishing. Um, and I kind of think those sorts of questions, I mean, I, I, I can speak to those observations. I think ultimately it's a question for Indigenous authors and Indigenous publishers themselves. But I think the sort of... The specificity that I can talk to, I think a couple of the challenges, one is that I I still find the technology that you're working with is still very Western centric and it can still pop up in ways that can be really kind of surprising at times. I mean, 10 years ago, I remember we were still having big battles at that time trying to get macrons, you know, and diacritics to appear on reading systems. And so macronization for um, Te Reo Maori was just an absolute simple simple thing that needed to be there in the ebooks but it was actually quite a big challenge um and to some extent has been overcome but you'll still find instances where where things like macrons are not well hand handled and um i think you know you're seeing this come up again with regard to everything from indigenous data sovereignty questions through to obviously artificial intelligence um and um i think there's a there's potentially a new wave of these sorts of inherently Western-centric technologies presenting challenges for Indigenous authors, Indigenous publishers, and publishers working with Indigenous authors like ourselves. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges. I think also the sort of the drive to openness has always got to be very attendant to questions of sort of protocol around Indigenous knowledge. And I think that can mean a lot of different things from what I've observed. But one simple example is is just um, uh, permissions around um, images. Um, so we we published a big book called Tangata Whenua, an illustrated history back in 2014, which is a, a pretty amazing account of, of the indigenous peoples of here from earliest time right up to effectively present day. And we published that in print only because it was a real hurdle to, to get digital permissions at that point in time. Um, and we've now we're just about finally about to release the ebook for this work, and it's taken us about three years and a lot of time, a lot of money, um, to clear the image permissions. And we've had to, you know, go off and speak to people right across the land to to explain what we're doing and explain how we're going to use that. And that is a time and a cost, but it's also something we've been very happy and in some ways privileged to do because it's allowed us to have very interesting conversations with people who own the rights to these images. Um, to explain more what we're doing and to establish in, in some instances relationships with those rights holders and um, there's no you can't you know that's always going to be a cost and 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 in a time involvement that is there and you can't overlook that and um, sometimes when I look at sort of the offshore modeling that you see around the cost of doing a uh, a history title or a non-fiction title in an OA model, I, I don't see those costs represented in that modeling. Um, so that's something that's that's there. As to the opportunity, um, I mean, it, it sort of goes back to what I said at the start. I, I think, you know, there are these profound um, international networks of Indigenous researchers and scholars and um, and, and publishers at times. And um, I just think that's really just about the most exciting thing globally that I see in terms of research and knowledge, uh, we're very fortunate to go to the um, NISA conference in 2019 at Waikato University, which is one of the big indig indigenous studies associations. And that was that just blew me away. It was by far and away the most impressive conference I've been to. Um, and just the scale and the energy and the interest and the commitment to sort of knowledge and scholarship um, was was remarkable, and I think that's um, I think that's a really big opportunity for for publishers of all kinds into the future. Thanks, Tom. Um, we're getting close to uh, at the end of our time, so I might just touch on a couple of questions we've got in Slido. Um, 
uh, Siggy, there's a question here that says, if you're discouraging early authors who want to publish with you because of prestige, how do you find them again when they're in a better position? They come to us because they, you know, because open access is important to them. Um, and that's why they wanted originally to publish. Um, and also, presumably, they're working in the fields that the the scholars who are um, editing the book series, you know, that, that there's a certain prestige that is associated with those names and people come and want to be part of that community. Thank you for that question. Um, thank you. Uh, there's also a question here about uh, what sort of revenue do OA publishers see from their work? So if it's, if you are, you know, publishing as a print version as well as a, an online version, is that a substantial part of your review? Is it uh, a nice to have? Is it, you know, I think uh, Nathan will have known this from his previous life at Monash as well. So Siggy or Nathan, if you want to comment on that one. Nathan, would you like to? Yes, well, it 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 varies. Um, sometimes surprisingly high, and sometimes sort of not at all. Um, my view is that um, the print uh, product um, is quite uh, different, and that if you can add value to the the print product with its um, by, for instance, having hardback and um, adding other design features that you can sell uh, the, the, the print book uh, also. Um, and I think that uh, in general, uh, revenue from, from sales uh, is, uh, is important uh, and that we do need to, we do need to sell our content. Um, with, our new press has always sold uh, its eBooks into the library sector and that um, uh, is just an important part of the uh, the the model. And um, you know we depend upon that support for us as a not-for-profit publisher uh, from from libraries, uh, so that we can um, you know operate more effectively. And if I might just add, <clears throat> we have yet to crack the library um, purchasing channels, and there's been a lot of uh, work among small open access presses, particularly in the UK and Europe, to try to find some sort of consortium model, something whereby the open access um, content can be purchased by libraries, but it's an ongoing battle, and um, and we haven't you know, libraries just do not buy open humanities press books unless they're recommended by scholars to, you know, in, for individual titles. So what we find is um, we have a few titles that are by big names, you know, Isabel Stengers, Timothy Morton, and these are books that sell really pretty well um, for academic books, but the vast majority of our books, um, you know, we'll be lucky if we sell five, you know, or 10. Uh, it's, it's really not... It's not a money-making venture, I can say that. But, you know, there, we see that there's benefit in what we're doing and um, and we find other ways of recouping our investment through things like, um, you know, as an academic, we have a requirement or, you know, a desirability to, to perform service to the community and, you know, engagement and those kinds of things. And, and it's in those ways that um, my time gets compensated rather than monetarily and and I'm happy with that that's that's good. if the if the books uh, can be in the libraries you know that they get so much you know I hope that that's a value to the to the library but it's also a value to readers you know discovering them in that context because there's a lot of other resources then that uh, that they get through um, through going in through the library yeah, we, we would love it if our books would be um, picked up by libraries, but it just it continues to be um, uh, just, yeah, a, a brick wall that we keep coming up against. There's a large project that Open Humanities Press was spearheading heading in the UK, which was precisely to try to deal with this issue, but um, I'm not really sure our success. We're not selling a lot, but that is something, you know, I want to yeah. uh, address and work on. Mm -hmm. 
So luckily, I think that there is a topic of discussion for how can libraries, what can libraries do in this space uh, in the, the breakout? So um, those of you who are going to stay for that um, will have an opportunity to talk about that. Uh, unfortunately, we run out of time and I'm conscious that um, some of our speakers do have another meeting, uh, other things that they need to get to. Um, Tom, I just will note that there's a number of quest a number of people have expressed an interest in knowing more about your ebook platform on the Slido, but perhaps that's not a question we can answer in the next 30 seconds. Um, um, but I, I guess you. if you're open to people approaching you about that, um, that yes, might please. be the way forward. So Sure, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, if Richard or someone had my email to hand, I'm very happy to answer questions afterwards. I'm very sorry I can't I can't hang on for the following hour, but but thank you. Yeah. So I will I'll take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists today. I think it's been a really interesting conversation and uh, you know fascinating breadth of um, of approaches and understandings and uh, and things to think about here. Um, so. Uh, I don't, you can all do the virtual clap thing, I guess, in the little icon, if you know how to make the icon work, if you'd like to thank our speakers. Um, uh, for those who wish to stay on um, and who are able to do so, uh, we will be um, moving into um, a breakout discussion, but we will give you all five minutes uh, to take a deep breath, uh, do any break you might need to have, um, uh, and uh, we will... Um, uh, we'll discuss some of those issues raised today. And again, you can see some of those are, are in here. Um, some of the stuff we've already talked about today um, the, with the intention of summarizing those and putting those up on the Open Access Australasia blog site. Um, so uh, I think, Richard, if I'm correct, we are taking five minutes. So if everyone could be back at five past one, that would be excellent. Uh, thank you once again to, your, to the speakers uh, and we look forward to having more discussion in a minute. Thank you. I had a quick question for you. Yes. Uh, I'm just uh, just curious as people drop out of the room. Um, if there isn't a great selling, if there if you're not selling a ton, mm -hmm. what what is the what's the reluctance towards other people? I, I understand ideologically the reluctance towards other people taking the material for for um, use. If the, if the goal is to get it out as widely as possible, what what's the reluctance when people do do that? Is it, is it simply just the ethical issue of it or is it something more? Um, it's mostly our authors actually who feel that it's um, a violation of the contract that they signed. Oh, okay. um, when they when they come to Open Humanities Press, there's you know for whatever it's worth, there is a certain prestige that we have um, developed over time, yeah. um, and part of uh, part of what we sell is also uh, a certain aesthetic as well. You know, so the right. the book series have different book covers that are designed by artists, and you know, so there is a, a sense in which there is a package that has been. Um, you know that that the authors want as the as the outcome of their relationship with us, and then for their text, their their content to them in slap slap between grey pages with identical, you know, yeah. uh, just a stamp, and then you know, and have it then freely, you know, not freely, but um, expensively um, <laughs> on Amazon. With uh, that, it just feels like that's not what they signed up for yeah. when they when they signed with OHP. Yeah, I can see that. I, I'm, I'm always curious about that relationship, knowing how uh, expensive any academic book is and the, the the readership, the people of whom we're asking the money, uh, you know, uh, if we're asking um, the, universe, the university library, it's indirectly paid for by the student in some way or you know, and there, there isn't, uh, there isn't a, we were joking about it today, we were talking about you know, when we do publish an academic book, how many people actually read it and, you know, what how, how many copies are sold. So I was just curious, you know, if it is getting wider readership, but I can see the, I could see the ideological um, argument there. So they, yeah, thank you. I, I, I didn't, I didn't want to come across as being um, confrontational on it. I'm just curious about it more than anything, you know. No, um, I, I think that's right. And um 
you know, this is something that uh, that we have, you know, we are thinking about whether or not to put a non-commercial license on on books mm. to try to avoid this. Um, We've had one situation where an author was very unhappy with the repackaging of his work. Mm. And what we ended up doing is uh, reissuing the book. You know, he wrote a second, a new sort of preface to it. And so we reissued it because what happened actually is that his version of uh, his original edition stopped being available for sale on Amazon. And only the pirate edition was available. Wow. Um, through the mystery of how Amazon, you yeah. know, works. Um, and that was our workaround for that was to republish the book with a, with a new preface um, and to do that under a, a non-commercial license. You know, the, I guess part of the pull here for me, which I find interesting, is because obviously we want our work to get out or we want the work to get out. In my case, I'm just editing a volume. but You can't get it from Amazon until you've actually been through the transactional process anyway so if the other one isn't available anymore then you you literally can't get it you know even though there should be another version of it somewhere mm. yeah. yeah okay we're at uh, five past david so if david's still there i am sorry <laughs> just, clicking, click, just so clicking, the, uh, clicking the zoom buttons and getting us back Jolly good. So we've gone down to about 50 people, which is actually excellent um, because we were a bit worried we were going to have far too many people for the breakout part. <laughs> so that means we've got the um, enthusiastic um, the people left on the call who are enthusiastic for the breakout session. So do you want me to just explain? Please do. Everyone? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll share my screen again. Uh, and hopefully everyone can see that. Now, in the chat, I've just dropped a link as well. I'm going to go on to the next slide. So our plan for um, the next part of the session today is, uh, so uh, my colleague uh, Arthur and I and the rest of the um, organizing committee from OAA were really keen for this to have something kind of concrete that came out of it. And we wanted to hear from the people who came along to the session as well, not just the panelists um, in the first part of the session. So what we want to do is we're going to put people into uh, breakout rooms. If we've got 50, we'll, I'll probably go through five people in each room. Actually, we've gone down a little bit more. Obviously, as I'm talking more about people having to do something, they're deciding they're going to drop off. Cool. Um, anyway, groups of, say, four or five. We're going to chat for about 15 minutes in those. We've got this document here, which you'll see a link that I've just popped in the chat for. I, I recommend everyone grab that link right now before I put you in breakout rooms, because you won't see that link in the chat. That is to a document where you can take a couple of notes. You don't feel compelled to take notes necessarily, but it will be useful if you do um, record a couple of aspects of your conversation. So when you follow that link um, and open it up in your browser, you will see, if I just come back over to my browser here, you will see this document. I can see people are appearing in here now. You'll see that it's arranged with some prompts for discussion. That was what I had on the slide there a moment ago. There's some prompts here. Don't feel you have to be restricted to these if the conversation in your group goes a different way or there's something that we haven't highlighted here that you think was really important. Um, a couple of our panelists are staying on the call, so they'll have a chance to respond if you actually had some sort of thing you wanted to hear their thoughts on afterwards as well. Um, so there are some prompts there, ensuring our local voices are heard. Um, I noted in the chat, if people happen to notice that in the first part of the session, we couldn't find uh, an open access publisher um, from the big publishers, and in fact, none at all in New Zealand that were an open access publisher who could come and talk about the, the local voice uh, for this session today. What does sustainability mean? What are the opportunities and challenges in relation to Indigenous knowledge? Tom spoke very eloquently about that. Um, and what's the role of the library? So those are just some prompts. D don't, you know, um, feel you have to dis discuss all of these. Pick the one, maybe, um, or something else that you think is really important. Your instructions are here. So... You can see here, you can click on these links, or if you've got the menu thing on the side, you can go to just write some notes down for your breakout room number. Um, I'd encourage you to introduce yourselves to each other, just because it's nice to meet people in these sessions as well, rather than being passive listeners. Take a few notes, and when we come back after the 15 minutes or so, so we'll get away in about a minute, so about 25 past three, you'll see the message popping up saying we're going to bring you back into the main room, and we'll have a, a discussion. We'll see how things go about 
um, and how we deal with the questions that we get and the thoughts that are in the document here um, at that point. So hopefully that's clear to everybody. I'm going to stop sharing. So as I say, grab, make sure you've got that link there and you've opened the document. I can see there's, yeah, there's about 15 people in the document. We at least need one person from each group to have that link open. Um, and uh, Arthur and I, or certainly I am planning to um, visit the, the groups and make sure that um, everyone is going along well. So I am going for five breakout rooms. We're going to get four or five people in each one. So I'm going to click a button now and you should see a thing inviting you to join those rooms in a second. There we go. We'll see you all again shortly. Richard, do you want me to go into one? Should I go into? Can you see the breakout rooms on the screen? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I'm so a, I mean, I'm pick one if you to... think it's going to be lacking in people who have not joined and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Five hasn't, oh, it's got Janet in it. So like might three's, just got, Jan three's got heaps. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe I'd, I'd, I would move, maybe move somebody maybe, from three. Maybe move Siggy into room four. Maybe I would. Oh, I would it's just Siggy and. And Janet, Janet why, I, would, why I would, yeah, I would move those two. Um, I'll move Siggy into room four. Okay, you right. do. Yep. And then ja I'd move Janet to, Janet to two. Yep, makes sense. And shall I join two as well? Because then that's yeah. Elliot, I have plenty to say. I don't know who Gisella Chan is, but okay, I'll join to room two. What happens with the recording while we're doing this, by the way? Oh, it doesn't oh, record. It only right. it, it records um, what we're talking about here. Yeah, okay, so you have a bit of editing to so, do. Um, well, yeah, we may not include any of the second part of the hour. Yeah, it, it, the it's relatively here. easy to top and tail. Shall I pause it now at the risk of um, to unpause it? As long as you remember to unpause it, yeah, if you want to have the bit at the end. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll pause it, yeah. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Has everyone returned? It looks... We should be about right, I think, yeah. Pretty close. So I hope you all had a good chat um, and met new and exciting people and learned new and exciting things. Um, so what we might do is we'll just have a quick run around because I think there were four groups, Richard. Is that right? Yep, yep that's right. Um, and just perhaps give, you know, just a couple of minutes summary on what you discussed. Uh, and if you could start by saying which of the questions you decided that was your main focus, if any, uh, and then, you know, a quick summary of what you talked about, and then we'll pretty much be done, I think. So I'll start with group number one. Uh, I'm sure everyone remembers what group number they're in, don't you? Excellent. Yeah. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Garth, because you were in my group. Yes. Uh, so we initially thought we were going to discuss the sustainability, but we ended up talking more about the role of academic libraries. Um, we discussed the question that uh, Siggy brought up about uh, how libraries can, how they can get their uh, books sold at libraries. And it's a bit of a mess. There, there's budget reasons that it can't go in. And if you join aggregators, we thought maybe libraries can make recommendations to aggregators about what books they want, especially things like uh, places like Informit, which are expanding their OA selections. Uh, we also discussed um, where the publishers should be going to libraries and looking at their collections and saying, you know, what gaps can we fill in your collection with OA resources? Um, and that might be a, an approach to take. Uh, we also discussed um, how they're trying to sell print, but libraries have less and less space. Um, so it, it is hard for libraries to uh, buy print copies in, instead of just getting the uh, freely available electronic copies. Um, 
we did discuss different pay models that libraries and these publishers, these OA publishers can use, uh, things like the subscribe to open uh, model or uh, paying for access for a certain amount of period and then getting it open for everyone. Uh, and then we try to rein it back into the role of the academic library rather than that uh, particular question. And we thought that libraries have options of uh, being more pro proactive in finding and making accessible uh, OA books uh, just through promoting them in their collections, but also through their online guides and when uh, access is res restricted, just offering more links and information about OA alternatives. That was pretty much us. Lovely. Thank you, Garth. Uh, I'll move on to breakout room two, who is speaking from group two. Uh, I think I am. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Elliot Bledsoe. Uh, from the Australian Digital Alliance, the Australian Libraries and Archives Copyright Coalition, and the Creative Commons Australia chapter. So I guess in some ways, OA adjacent. Uh, but in breakout room two, we uh, particularly focus on the, uh, the conversation topic around uh, local academic voices in the kind of global context, but we did have a fairly wide ranging uh, and nuanced conversation. Um, in particular, we uh, we talked a lot about uh, you know kind of the changing environment that uh, OA finds itself in, both kind of within the wider open movement, but also uh, you know the, the changing kind of makeup of the information uh, environment in terms of things like uh, proprietary ownership, etc., and that that's kind of been. Uh, I guess, propelled forward by AI uh, and the kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of culprit ownership of information uh, that we've certainly seen historically in things like scholarly publishing, but that we're seeing kind of move forward at an exponential rate under the kind of uh, increase of AI. But also we talked about why uh, these kinds of movements, even though they have been around for a long time, need to be mindful of the fact that they don't represent all voices uh, and that also that new players, new people, new kind of voices need to be part of that conversation. And we have to remember that uh, some people's journeys might only just be starting, even though some of us, like myself, are a bit of a hack and have been around uh, for a long time. And that, that kind of renewal is actually really important uh, for motivational sustainability uh, of these kinds of movements that new people need to kind of come in and get excited and be enthusiastic and learn more and adapt and evolve their advocacy uh, and to own some space uh, in that kind of bigger objective of uh, open access. One of the other things we talked a little bit too about is um, how the change of environment is actually changing the nature of different types of open uh, initiatives or uh, you know, uh, movements like OA. And that um, while we're not necessarily proposing to abandon the objective, for example, of opening up access to knowledge and culture, that perhaps the context that we sit in has changed. And so uh, as we see this increasing kind of um, commercialization and consolidation of information that actually now more than ever free culture uh, or sorry open knowledge and culture is more important than perhaps it's ever been and that there's a need to relook at why we do the things that we do and reassert the principles that are important to OA and, and to related open movements um, particularly as uh, you know, systems like AI hoover up information from all over the place and uh, perpetuate inherent uh, inequalities and uh, are raised voices as it, uh, you know, pulls in the free internet. Um, so quite wide ranging, but I think uh, the kind of key thing we came to is that uh, a recognition that 
there are a wide range of voices. Local academics, uh, for example, are an important part of the OA infrastructure, but that even that as an idea is not one homogenous group. Um, anybody else from group two want to make any comments? Well, that, that was a great summary, Elliot. I, I think the only thing, I, I guess the thing that we're all kind of coming to is that it's, it's a very nuanced landscape nowadays and yeah, there's, it's and quite complex and that's kind of okay. And I feel, I feel like some of us are sort of strugg still struggling with this, like, we should just tell people what to do. And we said this five years ago, why is nobody doing it? You know, we've just got to understand that we have to um, understand the complexities and work with that, I think. And, and be prepared to evolve. So, I mean, like AI is an example, and certainly for me, working with indigenous culture, understanding that really, you know, what we thought was a great idea 20 years ago, maybe isn't quite so great now when you're thinking about other contexts. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Elliot. All right, group three. Volunteers from group three. This group went wrote over in page worth of notes. <laughs> so, okay, um, I typed them. So, I'll, yeah. I'll, um, thanks, Danny. So, so we we talked about the role of the academic library as well. Um, we started with the we don't need no stinking publishers because we can do it ourselves, and so that was our sort of starting point. Um, and there's a lot happening in libraries. Um, and then talked a little bit about the, the, the assessment of research as being part of the problem. The prestige is partly the assessment problem and that, that doesn't necessarily recognise um, the work that is coming out of, out of libraries in terms of publishing. There's also the question of publishing being very difficult. Um, it's a lot of skills, uh, skills that aren't necessarily inherent to a library. That's not the end of the world, but it does take up a lot of time and we're not necessarily paid to do it. Um, and um, then the question about whether prestige itself is a form of elitism and which, of course, the answer to that is yes. Um, and uh, then we talked about questions about why people publish work. Uh, and um, then we've had experiences where people have made their work available online to students and then had other other people come back to them going, look at this great resource I found online and it's theirs, um, which is sort of a, a problem. And that's that's sort of not necessarily putting something within the publishing framework, but it is putting it in within into the sort of open framework. Um, and then we talked about an experience in the construction industry recently where there was no local textbooks. The textbooks that the students were having to use were um, overseas ones and they, the, the, there were major differences between different countries about construction so there was a push to put to create a local open access one um, but they weren't in necessarily allocated the type of time that it took to create that work um, and uh, then another question was once something is open access is there a deflection process once it's been superseded um, and who would be responsible for that so I suppose the theme that came through this was the question about recognition for the work that's been done, I guess, is probably an overarching theme. Uh, thanks, Danny. That deselection one is a really good question. I don't think I'd thought about it until you said it. And now, now you've made me nervous about that one. Um, another thing, another challenge in this space, I guess. Um, so breakout room four. Anyone? I'm happy to chat to that. Thank you. Else in the group to? Um, so, uh, yeah, we also work with what is the role of the academic library? Um, we talked about um, helping smaller publishers understand how to be more discoverable um, in library catalogs. So things around like metadata, mark records, you know, putting them into the community zone in Alma or discoverable through WorldCat, things like that. Um, and uh, leveraging consortia um, to make some of these things happen, um, maybe talking to Cole about um, adding something into their PD series to um, help smaller publishers um, learn about um, discoverability. Um, we also talked about educating publishing academics on digital publishing models and their choices um, and 
the kind of questions that they may want to ask publishers um, to ensure that their books actually can be accessed by their students through their institution. Um, and it's one of those problems that comes up a lot, um, particularly for me. This is something that I mentioned in our group is that only this week I had an academic who had published an excellent text and, um, you know, the content was fantastic, but it was so restricted and there was no download option. And, you know, it, it, they were very disappointed. They didn't realize that um, they didn't even know that after it had been published. It was only when we told them that um, that they realized and um you know, it was one of those, oh, if only I'd known before <laughs> kind of moments. So um, thinking about what is our role as an academic library in helping um, researchers who want to publish then understand those options as well. Um, is there anything that I missed um, to others in the group? Thank you. I think that... Um... That the question of OCLC and metadata is a really interesting one. As I mentioned earlier, we had seen some of our theses being commercially available earlier this year, and at least one of the people who'd done it had gone through the trouble of making the records in OCLC. So they were actually in WorldCat as um, you know, as books that were available to purchase, um, which was. Disappointing in one sense, and that we would have hoped that OCLC might have noticed this, but also, I guess, a sign of that two-edged sword, which is you make it easy for people doing the right thing to do these things, and some people who are doing the wrong thing will take advantage of those same uh, those same openings and uh, you know run through that uh, run through that passageway as well. So there's a um, you know, and I guess from an OCLC perspective two small publishers that they've never heard of have to be treated equally, whether one is legitimate and one isn't. Um, so really interesting question there, I think. Um, has anybody got any other comments, questions, thoughts that they would like to raise at this stage? Anyone who feels like there's been something that we haven't discussed or you're dying to ask about? Can I just put in a plug for, for the Director of Open Access Books and the Open Library that um, my, my new role, and I'm only a couple of months in, but my new role is the community manager for that. So I'm here as a resource. I've put my email address into the chat and please contact me. I'm going to organise. I, I feel that probably what would be sensible is trying to organise some um, session to, to talk about what kind of services that are available free of charge to libraries. Um, I think that would be really helpful for people is just trying to work out a time that works with Denmark and our different time zones across uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, but yeah, that's my plug. Thank you, Danny. And I, and I guess the question, the first question I might have, which I think Ash raised is, is DOAB in Alma's community site so that everyone who's got Alma can download all that with ease? And I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, I just. But I, got just his hand I, I don't know the answer to that either. So I've just, I, I just had those two things. You know, Ash mentioned it, and, and I think Richard's put in the chat that his catalogue is doing it. Yeah. So we, uh, we certainly at my institution, we are plugged into DOAB through their API or whatever. So their stuff is in our catalogue. Yeah. Um, but whether it's part of a an Elmer packer, I don't know that level of detail but, yeah, but that, yeah. might, that might be it that might be an easy way to approach that particular problem um because if it's in the alma thing lots and lots of people will make use of it um elliot go ahead hi um i just thought i'd make an observation on uh some of what i heard through the session today with my creative commons hat on and as i said completely acknowledging that i'm kind of oa adjacent rather than working directly on oa but I found it interesting some of the uh, comments that uh, speakers, et cetera, were making around the use or, or potential misuse of CC licensed material that they're publishing. And I guess a, a kind of a caution, I'm, I'm interested in maybe a little bit concerned that the, the solution people seem to be suggesting is to become more restrictive in terms of the licensing. And I guess one of the things I'll say in that space is that um, there's always good actors and bad actors. 
And the reality is that a bad actor is just as likely to, to ignore your all rights reserved copyright as they are to ignore your Creative Commons license. And so I think when we come back to principles about why we do these things, that the more important question is not, do we not like this use that's been made, but rather, um, does it serve any of the intended ambitions that we have? Does it share knowledge to people who otherwise wouldn't have got it? It doesn't necessarily mean that it changes the outcome, but I think it changes the way we approach the problem. Uh, and so I thought I'd just put that out there that, uh, you know, I, I think while obviously, you know, the things like that happen and we don't necessarily like them, I wonder if that's where we should be spending our time, effort and focus uh, or not. I'd be very interested to see what others think on that. I, I could comment on that, David. Yeah, I agree with you, Elliot. People have an emotional reaction to that sort of use. We've had a case that made national TV in New Zealand of a thesis from Victoria University Wellington that was being sold, redistributed. And in fact, that was just an all rights reserved thesis. It didn't have an open access license on it. And so the the you know, that was exactly the example you gave that the the not respecting the it didn't have a CC license on it. People also don't understand that CC licenses retain moral rights. I think there's a more interesting nuance around the the example Siggy gave of whether you choose like um it's the monetization aspect and so but you can still obviously choose a more restrictive cc license if that's the the you know the thing you're worried about then the last thing i'd say on this that people always forget is well two things actually one is when we talk about these examples because we have the emotional reaction to them we forget about the hundreds of thousands of good uses of cc licenses that happen because we focus on these ones where we have the moral outrage reaction, the PhD student who didn't have to get permission to reproduce that thing in their thesis. Think about how many PhD students there are in the world. You know, I just got contacted today by researchers who are doing a health promotion pamphlet and the article isn't OA that they want to re reproduce a graph from. So they have to go and get permission. They have to pay for it for a health outcome pamphlet that they want to distribute you know, a few hundred copies of to some community group. So those are the things we forget when we, we, you know, um, focus on those negative 